Let me encourage you to take a Bible, if you will, and open it back with me to the Gospel of Luke. Turn back with me to Luke chapter 23, where we want to read together here in just a few moments. If you didn't bring a Bible, there should be one very close to you, beneath the row of chairs in front of you. We encourage you to open up God's Word, and as you open it, appreciate what it is that we're holding in our hands this morning. We want to treat these words that we read as God breathed, so that practically speaking, what we're doing is hearing from the God who created us. We are glad that you are here this morning. Famous last words are an interesting form of communication to many people. There are entire books in libraries and bookstores that contain nothing but famous last words. Words of men and women who have left their impact one way or another on the world around us. There are entire websites, very popular websites online that are dedicated simply to the last words, the last phrases of people who one way or another this world remembers. We want to talk this morning about the most important last words of all. Have you ever thought about the last words of Jesus of Nazareth? And even 2,000 years later, why those last words still matter. As we open our Bibles back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23, would you gather with me by faith to the foot of the cross where we hear the first of seven last statements of Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 33, we read words of forgiveness. Luke 23 and verse 33, when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals. The gospel writers just tell us exactly what happened without any embellishment. But as we go back in our minds, we see him laid on the ground on two enormous pieces of wood, and we hear the sound of the hammer. And we imagine that rugged nail that is driven through his left wrist, and then another nail that is driven by hammer blows through his right wrist, and how his feet are fastened with a nail to this wooden plank. And how eventually suspended against those two planks of wood, the body of Jesus is lifted up, suspended between heaven and earth. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Hear those last words this morning and consider what we learn from them. Last words of forgiveness that encapsulate the entire mission of Jesus. This is why He was here. This is why the Son of God, who was with God and was God from the very beginning, left the glories of heaven and was born to a helpless virgin. This is why for the first 30 years of his life, he grew in relative secrecy. We don't know very much at all about those first 30 years. But then at about 30 years of age, he steps on the scene. And one who had been told by God to be prepared points at this Jesus of Nazareth and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This Lamb of God, Jesus of Nazareth, 
was not shy about telling people what was going to happen. He himself on more than one occasion told his followers, we're going to go to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be mocked and rejected and scorned and beaten and crucified. And on the third day he will rise again. On the night of his betrayal, he took bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. This is why he had a body. He took a cup that night with the twelve and had them pass it around and drink of it and said, This is my blood which is shed for many, blood of the new covenant that is going to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. This is why he had blood flowing through that human body. This is what his mission on earth was all about. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. In Luke chapter 23, we keep reading in verse 39 where we run across words of assurance. Luke chapter 23 and verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. This is why government exists in the grand scheme of things. This is what Rome did Two known criminals. These two men were thieves and everyone knew that they were thieves. And by this man's own acknowledgement, we deserve, we are receiving the just penalty for the choices that we have made and the actions that we have taken. But this man who is suspended on this cross between the two of us, he has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Somehow, one way or another, this man knew the name of Jesus and not just the name. Somehow, some way, somewhere along the, 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 the road in his life up to this point, he knew Jesus has things to say about being a king and having a kingdom and what is to come. And so his plea is very simple. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Last words of assurance. That there is more to our existence than what meets our earthly eyes. Our existence does not come to a close when we take our last breath with these earthly bodies. There is more to earthly existence than what we do here on this planet. There is more. And those last words of Jesus Show us that. You might keep your marker there in Luke 23. We'll come back there in a moment. Turn with me in your Bibles to the last of the Gospels. Back to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. We spend so much of our time this morning in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. This time, John chapter 19, verse 25, beginning where we run across words of compassion. John chapter 19 and verse 25. See with your eyes of faith. See standing by the cross of Jesus, His mother. You think with me about what it was like this morning to be her. See through eyes of faith His mother's sister. 
Mary, the wife of Clopas, see with your eyes of faith Mary Magdalene, and you remember what Jesus has done for her. Here are women when all others have fled or are watching from a great distance, standing there by the cross are these women. And when Jesus, suspended between heaven and earth, sees His mother and the disciple whom He loved, that's John, standing nearby, He said to His mother, Woman, behold your son. Then He said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to His own home. Jesus takes the time in physical agony, in mental anguish, with the weight of the world on His shoulders to breathe out, having to push up with His feet just in order to breathe. And every time He pushes Himself, He feels with His human nerves the nails that are driven between His wrists and His feet and this wood. But He takes the time. He finds it important to breathe out words of compassion that reveal His concern for His loved ones. In the Gospel of Matthew, this time chapter 27, We hear last words of anguish. Matthew chapter 27, you begin reading with me in the 45th verse of the chapter. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. From the sixth hour, we would say from noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. We would say three o'clock. Right there when the sun shines the brightest during the day, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, at about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting from the words of David in Psalm 22. Think with me about how those last words of anguish convey the horrific consequences of sin. I would suggest to you, as far as we can tell, the Son had never experienced separation from the Father. From all eternity, every indication in God's revelation to mankind would be that there was perfect fellowship, communion, harmony between the Father and the Son. And now with some of His last breaths, Jesus takes the time to quote Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the larger testament of God's revelation tells us exactly why. God is perfectly holy. Hundreds of years before, through his prophet Habakkuk, God had communicated to mankind, My eyes are purer than to behold evil. They cannot look on iniquity. Rebellion against God, unholiness, unrighteousness, those actions, those deeds, those thoughts, those words that are out of character with godliness, God will not be a part of. 700 years before this day on the cross, God had used His prophet Isaiah to assure people My hand is not so short that it cannot reach you. My ears are not so deaf that they cannot hear you. It is your sins and your iniquities that have made a separation between me and you. Your sins have hidden my face from you. You have done this to our relationship, God says. And as the Lamb that God is providing for the sins 
of the world. This is not the Lamb that any human being is providing for our sins. This is the Lamb picked and provided by God for our sins. The sins of all humanity. Is the blood of that Lamb is being shed. There is separation between the Father and the Son. And in agony, bearing the horrific judicial consequences of sin, the Son cries out as one forsaken. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 28, we read words of suffering. John chapter 19 and verse 28, Jesus has gotten to the point when He knows the finish line is imminent. After this, John 19 verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said to fulfill the Scripture, I thirst. You think with me, about the last several hours of the life of Jesus, how very late at night He is taken from the Garden of Gethsemane, arrested like a common criminal. He's taken before Jewish courts and He's slapped across the face and He's blindfolded and He's mocked as He's told, tell us who prophesied, who is it that is striking you? He stands before Pilate. He is flogged and beaten as leather straps with nails and pieces of glass and shards of metal are embedded on the end of that. And a Roman soldier has a wooden handle on the other end of those leather straps. And over and over and over again, those leather straps are thrown across his bare back and the, the, the bits of that glass and metal are ripping into his flesh. And now he has carried the cross outside of the city walls. And he's been nailed to a cross for hours. How long has it been since he's had a drink of water? Words of suffering that demonstrate His very relatable humanity. He had a body just like us. John chapter 19, verse 30, we read words of victory. When Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, It is finished. Words of victory that reflect the fulfillment of God's eternal plan. Before God said, let there be light. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, God had a plan. A plan to redeem mankind. You think with me all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when God promised that one would come as the seed not of man but of woman and would eventually crush the head of the serpent that had deceived Adam and Eve. We think through the promises to Abraham through the 400 plus years of Israelite slavery in Egypt. We think about the conquest of the promised land and about how God establishes judges for these people as a new nation is formed in a wonderful land. But how over and over and over again they turn away from Him. They don't want God as their king. They want a king like the nations around them. And so God gives them what they ask for. And over and over and over again, king after king turns the people, leads the people away from God. Eventually, God, after sending prophet after prophet after prophet, does not speak to His people for 500 years. Until finally, John, standing on the banks of the Jordan River, 
points to Jesus of Nazareth. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You think with me about the hundreds, literally hundreds of Old Testament references, prophecies about who this Messiah would be. And now as He has been hanging on the cross for hours, He says, It is finished. Back where we marked our Bibles in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 45. Final words of submission. Luke 23, verse 45. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. A couple of months ago on a Sunday night, we talked about the spiritual significance of that. As that curtain is torn, Jesus calls out with a loud voice and He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Hear those words this morning with ears of faith, words of submission. Having done everything in every way that the Father wanted Him to do. Words of submission. The cup has been drunk. The cross has been endured. And now a spirit is completely committed to God. I would suggest to you words of submission in anticipation of a reunion with His heavenly Father. When we think about the last words of Jesus, these are the sorts of words perhaps that first come to our minds. Could I encourage you to open your Bibles with me back to the Gospel of Matthew 28 and understand that these were not His last words while He was here on this earth. That is why we are here this morning on this first day of the week as we strive to be every first day of the week. Remembering that our Lord died on the cross, but three days later He rose from the dead. And there were more last words. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 10, we read words of assurance. He appears to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who had been right there at the foot of the cross. And He says to them in Matthew 28 verse 10, Do not be afraid. Words of reassurance that there is nothing to fear. You go and you tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Keep your marker there in Matthew 28 and turn back with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24 beginning in verse 36 where we read words of verification. This time not to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary but to the eleven apostles who have been scared out of their minds who've been locking the doors behind them, huddling, just waiting for what is to come. In Luke 24, in verse 36, as these apostles are talking about these things, Jesus Himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I Myself. It is really Me. I really died. Touch Me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. In Luke 24 and verse 44, we read words of perspective. He says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. I told you this is what it was all about. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Words of perspective on the big picture of God's revelation to mankind. This is what the Old Testament was pointing to. Turn in your Bibles with me back to the Gospel of John chapter 20. John chapter 20 where in verse 29 we read words of blessing. This time the apostles and Thomas 
the eleventh apostle, who was not there when Jesus first appeared and interacted with these men and spends an entire week in skepticism saying, I will not believe unless I see Him with my own eyes and touch Him with my own hands. And in John 20, verse 29, as Thomas has humbled himself in front of his Lord and his God, Jesus says, have you believed because you have seen me? Hear him this morning as he says, Blessed are those who have not seen. That's me. That's you. Who through the writings of these men, believe. Appreciate on this first day of the week that Jesus took the time to say words of blessing for those who will believe though they have never seen. In John chapter 21 and verse 15, we read words of restoration. Jesus takes the time specifically to talk to Peter, who three times, the third time with an oath, swears that he does not even know this Jesus of Nazareth. And now on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, they have finished breakfast. Jesus looks at Simon Peter and asks, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. And a third time, corresponding with three denials of Peter, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? Undoubtedly, Peter remembers how many times he had denied him. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Words of restoration that testify to the grace of God. You go back with me where our Bibles were marked in Matthew chapter 28 and the 18th verse of the chapter where we read words of supreme authority. Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus has gathered these closest of followers to Him on a mountain outside of the city walls of Jerusalem and He says to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Words of supreme authority authority as the central figure in all of human history. Words of supreme authority that are followed by words of commission. I want you to do something. Go therefore, Matthew 28 verse 19, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is why you and I, even 2,000 years later, are still here. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Words of commission that shape the rest of his disciples' time on this earth. Would you end with me at the last book, the last page of written Revelation. Back to Revelation chapter 22. When we think about the last words of Jesus, we ought to think not just words spoken from the cross, When we think about the last words of Jesus, we ought not to think just about words that He spoke in His resurrected glory before ascending back to His Father in heaven. When we think of the last words of Jesus, we ought to think of Revelation chapter 22 
at the close of all of God's revelation to mankind. Verse 12, we run across words of coming judgment. Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Words of coming judgment and inescapable accountability to the God who knows everything. Revelation 22, verse 13, we read words of context. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the very first letter and the very last letter in the Greek alphabet. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. Words of context that focus the universal reason for everything on Him. It is all about Him. Revelation 22, verse 16, we read words of concern. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things to the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. He cares for His church. Which is why even 2,000 years later we have sung... Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. He cares for us. He cares for this church this morning. Finally, Revelation 22 and verse 20. The Bible closes with words of promise. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Think with me about the last words of Jesus and why they still matter. Words that encapsulate His entire mission. Words that communicate that existence, your existence, my existence involves more than meets our earthly eyes. Words that reveal concern for those Jesus loves. Words that convey the horrific consequences of sin. Words that demonstrate His relatable humanity. Words that reflect the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. Words that anticipate a reunion with His heavenly Father. Words of reassurance that there is nothing to fear. Our King is no longer in the grave and there is nothing to fear. He has indeed conquered death. He holds the keys of death and the grave. Words that put into context the big picture of God's entire revelation to mankind. Words of blessing for those who are willing to believe, though they have not seen with their physical eyes. Words that testify to the grace of God. For those even who would deny Him and turn their back on Him. Words that establish Him as the central figure in all of human history. Words of commission that shape the rest of His disciples' time on this earth. Words of coming judgment and inescapable accountability to God. Words that focus the universal reason for everything on Him. Words of concern for His churches. And words of promise that He is coming again. Last words that communicate the gospel. Last words that communicate exactly what each and every one of us need to come face to face with this morning. Last words that could be really encapsulated in just two words. Follow me. 
Everything that is necessary for you to be forgiven of your sins has been done. Will you respond? Before ascending to his Father in heaven, this risen Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Would you be willing to begin following him this morning? If you're a child of his and like Peter, you have followed him at a distance to the point that you have denied him, his lordship, his kingship in your life. Words of perfect, amazing grace are available. And they are words that you can hear this morning. Can we pray with you, for you? If in any way we can be of any help, would you let us know how by coming to the front while we stand and sing?